Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think is finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. Attention, if you are a frustrated man who feels like he's not getting the results he wants in his life, health, wealth, relationships, and personal growth, then I've got a powerful free video training for you to help you become a strong, grounded man so you can unlock unlimited power in your life, business, and relationships. Go to kfmconfidence.com to get instant access to this training. Again, that's kfmconfidence.com. If you want a Cliff Notes version of the best material that I've learned after 300 interviews on this podcast about being a stronger, more powerful man, then it's all here at kfmconfidence.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Dr. Fred Knorr. He's a double board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He's voted six times as one of America's top physicians. He's a former clinical instructor at the University of Illinois School of Medicine, and he's the author of True Love, How to Use Science to Understand Love, which is what we're going to dive into in today's episode. Dr. Fred Knorr, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. And so I'm noticing an accent. Where are you from? I was born in Egypt. Egypt. All right. Well, we'll hear your story of coming from Egypt to the United States. But before we do, let's start off with a quote, something that you've lived by, something that's helped you on your journey. And what does it mean to you? With persistence, you can achieve anything your heart desires. All right. And how does that apply to your journey and story? Let me tell you, I was in medical school by the fourth year of my medical school. I am a Coptic Christian, so I'm a minority in Egypt. And the Muslim Brotherhood were becoming more powerful. I had some problem with my classmates, a guy by the name of Ayman El Zawahi. We had a fight in the third year medical school. So I decided that my future in Egypt is very limited as a Christian minority, that the best choice is to go to America. So I went to the American embassy to ask them what they have to do to immigrate to America as a physician. They gave me a brochure about an exam called ECFMG and told me, you fill the application, you take the test, you pass, you bring me the papers, and I will have you complete an immigration form and you're ready to go to the U.S. So I took the brochure home and discovered that the test is not offered in Egypt. The test is over in London, Paris, and Athens. I've been to London before, so I finished medical school, took a flight to London a few days before the test, took the test, passed it. Very happy, now I can go with the letter to the American Embassy in London and tell them that here it is, I'm ready to fill the immigration papers. I go there, I give it to the lady, and she tells me, I'm sorry, sir, We are in the month of October. Last month, the U.S. Congress just passed a new law requiring physicians to take a new examination (laughs) to qualify for a visa. So they named it the Visa Qualifying Examination. So now you have to take the new examination. No big deal. I can take examination anywhere, when and where it is. No, sir, the law was just passed last month. It's going to take us at least a year to set up the examination. So I had a choice either go back to Egypt as a failure or stay in England, take their exams and practice there until the examination comes out. So the examination comes out, I apply for it, I go and take it and I pass it. (laughs) Hallelujah, that's it, I'm ready to go to America. Go back, same lady, here's the thing I passed. By the way, the visa qualifying examination is called a competitive examination, meaning you do not need to have a minimum level of knowledge. Everybody take the examination. They rank you from the best to the bottom. Then decide how many people do want to take 
certain number of people, the top number will be considered pairs, the rest, in spite of their knowledge, will be considered failed. The year I took the examination, the U.S. Immigration Department decided to take 300 physicians. I was willing to take the test, and I was one of the 300 physicians out of about 7,000 worldwide. Wow. wow. But I passed it, so I was very confident. I'm going to go there. I'm going to have the immigration. So I gave them the paper, same employee. Me, oh, sorry, sir. They just came up with something new. Now what? Now you have to find a job in the U.S. You have to advertise it. And the response goes to a P.O. box, which is actually located in the Labor Department. And if the Labor Department does not find equally qualified physician to fill in the post, they will give you the so-called labor certification that you are needed and no equally qualified America is able. And you have you'll be able to use that certificate to apply for immigration. So I have now to find a job in the U.S. that gets offered to me. I have to have it advertised in the U.S. And if an American applies for it, I lost that position. I am in London. This is your city. Who is going to bring somebody all the way from London for an interview? So he may take him, may, may not. Nobody. But I knew that American physician are used to recruit from Canada. So I had to leave England and go to Canada and work in Canada for a year so I can apply for a position in Canada. I got my first position in a town outside in Pennsylvania called McKeesport, applied for the job, put an ad in the professional paper for that, and somebody applied for it because he was from India and his brother was a U.S. citizen. So get immigration based on family reunion. So I had to start again, found a second job in Jacksonville, Florida. Advertised the job, and I was told later on, some, I believe somebody from El Salvador was married to an American woman as a result got the immigration. So finally, I got my third job in New Orleans, Louisiana. And luckily for me, nobody applied for the job. So I was able to get the labor certification from the labor department and then use it to apply to get the American visa and arrive to America and start to practice medicine. So right. it was perseverance that yeah, there got me is to achieve the, that. The journey of Dr. Fred Knorr from Egypt to the UK, to Canada, to the United States. And, and I, I almost for a second was going to come in and interrupt, but I think it's important for the audience to hear the story of how you came here in its entirety because I, the majority of my audience is here in America. They are born as Americans. And I think that's something that we take for granted is, is that look at how hard you're working to come here when the majority of my audience is just born here and I think it's important to, to realize and understand how bad people around the world want to be here. Absolutely, yes. Correct. This Our, is the best country on the face of the earth. And this, it is true. <laughs> Despite all the challenges and, and political things going on, it is still a great country to the greatest country, in my opinion, to be part of. And so... I just don't take that for granted. So that's your journey of, of persistence and, and perseverance of coming from Egypt to the United States and being able to successfully practice medicine. You are voted six times as Amer one of America's top physicians. You, you've been teaching in the past at the University of Illinois School of Medicine, and you have a book, which I now want to dive into. It's True Love. How do you science to understand love? What led you to write this book? It's actually two things. Number one, my education. I am a neurologist, so I spent 12 years studying the brain in very fine details. And then after that experience, I spent 30 years giving people medication, which are chemicals that will increase and decrease different chemicals in the brain and see the effect on the neurological disease, as well as the other effects on personality and behavior. In addition to that, I had a specific experience with the science of love, in a sense, by accident. I started a support group in 1989 for multiple sclerosis. In 1992, the monthly meeting fell on Valentine's Day. So the people in the meeting asked me to give a lecture about love or related to Valentine's Day and not about multiple sclerosis. 
So I prepared a lecture based on my interest before in the knowledge about love, because I had an observation that some of my friends got married and were very happy with their marriage. Other similarly intelligent and capable people got married and were miserable. Zulia is curious, why is that? Why did that happen? So with the lecture, people liked it, asked me for it again. So I had to keep researching the science about love every year to include in the lecture and to refine it further and further. And it continued to get refined since 1992. Mm. And so what are the stages of love that you found? Yes, love is not one event at one time. It's not true that love can touch us one time and last in a lifetime. Love is a series of events that happen in four distinct phases. The first phase is mate choice or selecting a mate. The second phase is falling in love. The third phase is actually falling out of love. And the final and permanent phase, I call it true love. Each one is based on different chemicals and genes and brain structure. Is this all with the same person or these are just different stages that you would find people in? No, it's this, the same person will go through the four stages one by one. With, they might with not be one, aware of it, but they do. With one partner. So they actually fall in love, then they fall out of love, and then it turns into true love. As if they don't do the knee-jerk reaction, I fell out of love, I believe that love should last forever, then something is wrong, let's have a divorce and try again. They get married a second love, the same thing happened, a third marriage, the same thing happened. You know, some are married seven and eight times, still do not find true love, are you because they could not wait. Are you saying that the breakup or, or the feeling of not being connected to each other anymore and feeling like a breakup is the next step... Is, is actually a part of creating true love. It is correct. It's part of the brain chemistry, and it has a purpose, and it has benefits for us. It doesn't happen by accident for no reason. It happened for a reason. So <laughs> when people do break up, it, it's almost in a way, can we agree that they were almost three feet from gold, where if they would have worked through those challenges, that true love was, was on the horizon? That is correct. If they wait long enough, they will, unless there are big, big problems. One of the benefits of falling out of love is to get you to see reality. We all know that, quote, love is blind. Why do we say that? It's based on brain chemistry. The second phase of love, romance, of falling in love, there are chemicals that increase in the brain called monoamines, and these cause illusions, delusions, and you don't see reality. It's, it's, it's like a dream, a fantasy. You feel euphoric, you feel happy, you feel excited, you feel on top of the world, but it's not reality. Let me give you an example that I've seen firsthand. When I was a resident, there was another female a resident who was very intelligent, attractive, went to a party one night and met this good-looking, big-muscle guy, and instantaneously fell in love. Okay, I was surprised it was so sudden, but accepted that. Later on, we find more about the guy. She was a sub subspecialist. The guy was a warehouse manager. We felt a little bit difference in the education. Right. Later on, we find out that the guy has a criminal record, has been in jail before. <laughs> wow. But she cannot see that. Oh, everything will change. That was before we fell in love. Even now is not going to be different and so on. She could not see that person for what he is absolutely not. Until two years later, three years later, when she fell out of love from him, then she can see that he is a criminal, he steals, he cons people, and he does all of that. And for the first time, she discovered that she made a big mistake. Luckily for her, because of her education, she decided to wait on children, so she could not have children yet. So she didn't and was able to divorce him. And as a result, she can fall out of love from him and start all over with the correct partner. So falling in love, was useful to her, was important for her to see reality, to see that she made a terrible mistake, that it's time to make correction. Is love a chemical that keeps us with the other person, the partner, so that we mate? And the and, main and purpose for, the, there's a purpose for love, which to get us to bring the best 
genes possible to have children that are as good as they could be, to bring the best out of us and to continue to improve us, and also to hold us together so we can support these children until they're fully grown up and independent. So there are different phases for different functions. Mm, okay, so what are the chemicals? What, what is happening? Because you study medicine and, and drugs, and what chemicals in the different stages of love what is happening to us? Are we under the uh, consumption of a drug in many ways when we are falling in and out of love? Each phase has different sort of genetic basis. When you are doing mate selection, you're selecting which, world, which person you want to be with. You use genes inherited from the past. Some genes were inherited from frogs. Some genes were inherited from birds. Some genes we have as humans. And each one of these, we use it to make a step. From frogs, we proved by studies that they use vision to select mates. Look today and anybody on a dating website, what's the first thing you do? Yeah. You look at the picture. Right. Also interesting. Two people can look at the same woman and one will feel, wow, she's beautiful and stunning. The other guy, really, she's nothing. I don't like her at all. <laughs> Why is that? Right. They looked at that. Your genes mixed with this particular woman will produce children. The woman that you feel very attractive will produce children that are very healthy. And the one that you don't see as attractive, your gene mixed with her gene will produce children that are less healthy. So your instinct, we call it sometimes the chemistry is not there. We feel we don't want that person. We do the same by hearing and the genes we inherited from birds also add smell. We can smell a mate and tell if this is a good match for us or not. Wow. And so the chemicals inside of this, this process here, when we're, when we're falling in love, are these chemicals benefiting us or are these, are these, are these not helping us? Is, is, is love not a good thing here? No, love is a good thing. It's benefiting us. Let me give you an example. They did a study where they had men wear T-shirts for two days without showering, then took a shirt from the man and gave it to women to smell it, which man smells good, which man smells bad. Not all women choose the same man. First woman can like person A, but believe person B doesn't smell good. Second woman will feel the opposite. Person A smells bad, person B smells good. Now they took samples of the tissues to analyze the genes responsible for the immune system and see which mix of gene will produce healthier children. They prove that women smell men that will give them unhealthy children as not smelling good. Men that give them healthy children, they seem to smell better. I had that experience personally myself. <laughs> Let's when I was, yeah, when I was young, looking for a wife, a friend told me, oh, wow, there's this perfect woman. She's perfect. For you. She's educated, intelligent, have the same level of education, has the same uh, background, and so on. She showed me a picture. She's beautiful. I went and met the woman. She's nice. She's intelligent. But at the end of the day, you want to give her a hug, and she doesn't smell good. I told my friend, she doesn't smell good. He said, no, she's much perfect. No, she doesn't smell good. I said, no, next time. <laughs> I'm going to sort of, when you go to meet her, I'll come by accident, I give her a hug, I smell her, and I'll tell you if I smell anything unusual or not. He comes, does that, and leaves. I see her, then give her a hug, and feel she doesn't smell good. They said, no, I'm not going to see her anymore. Why do I want to be with a woman who doesn't smell good every time I come close to her? He didn't smell anything. He said, no, she smells beautiful perfume. I couldn't smell anything bad at all. I didn't know at the time what was happening. I just knew that my instinct is telling me, don't be with this woman, stay away from her. Later on, based on the other studies, I discovered that's because my genes, mixed with her genes, will produce unhealthy children. And my body was telling me, no, that's not a good match for you, stay away. And there's the story right there. So wh why is falling in love mere madness, as you say in your book? Yeah, in falling in love, you release a set of chemicals, at least four of them, I call them, they're called medically monoenzymes. These are one called epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. These cause the different manifestation of love by altering the balance of chemicals in the brain. So we start to perceive things not based on reality, but based on what we wish them to be. 
So you see the person and you start to fear she is the most beautiful woman I ever met. Maybe later on when you fall out of love, you are like, no, she's not that beautiful. How could I fear that she was the most beautiful woman in the world? She, they can do a lot of flaws. We cannot see it. We see everything is perfect. We get illusions, believing things that are not realistic, like the one I told you about, believe the guy with in and out of the jail will change completely because of love and will never commit a crime again. And of course, that did not happen. We start to do things like hoarding. Every little present or gift from the beloved is very valuable and important. We store it, which is typical features in, for example, schizophrenia, another brain disorder of the same chemicals. We become obsessed by them because of certain brain chemicals. We see them, our heart beat fast, our eyes pulsate, we feel anxious, we sweat because of brain chemicals in that phase of love. So everything you see is sort of deceiving us. We don't see the reality. We see imagination or fiction. We see distorted images. Like the guy with schizophrenia looks at the picture of his brother, can see it as a picture of Jesus. It's not, but does he truly see it this way? The image could change in the brain. I explain in the book exactly how does that happen. So you're comparing the same chemicals inside of a, someone who has schizophrenia to someone who is falling in love. There's some similarity, of course, but not to the same degree. Right, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a disease. distorted view of what you're it's, saying. It's, yeah, it's a small pictures of that. We acquire some of the feature, but to a lesser degree. Okay. And so so then how how is this helpful for us? It's because it's going to make us make unhealthy choices that could potentially not benefit us in the future. It will help us in that if you know that you are you're in the romance phase of love, that A, it's going to end. B, that you're not seeing reality. C, that it's good when it ends because now we can see reality and decide, am I making a good decision, making a bad decision? If you're making a good decision, even though you don't feel that you're in love anymore, just sit tight and wait till love comes after that. It takes time, but it comes. Yeah, Falling in love is sudden effortless but true love is slow and it takes time how, how long does this whole process take from you, you have it broken down into four stages here from beginning to uh, you know roughly about are we talking six months uh, two months are we talking three years on an average the person stay in the fears of falling in love for about two years to three years then you probably spend a year or so falling out of love. Then gradually you, you move into the true love, which is based on a totally different chemicals. Okay. Okay. And, and back to the whole falling out of love. Okay. How do we differentiate between a necessary breakup when this isn't going to work and we're experiencing a lot of problems in the relationship versus working through it because eventually, as in your book, the fourth stage here is true love. And what comes before that is falling out of love. Well, if you are in the fears of falling in love, but you still have a lot of problems, then that's not going to change. It is useful to realize early on that things did not go well and not going well, and the chances are they will not go well. And the solution is not to waste your time in that relationship, fall out of love and start all over. And if you don't fall out of love with somebody, you cannot love another person. Can you say that again? So if you're yes. still in love with a past partner, it's going to be difficult for you to fall in love with a new partner. Is that, that is correct. That's correct. The brain physiology repeats itself. Think about it from a woman's perspective. The woman can get pregnant by one person. And as long as she's pregnant by that person, she cannot get pregnant again by another person. You cannot find a woman who is four months pregnant by person A and two months pregnant by person B. She can never get pregnant again until she loses the baby from person A. That's correct? Right. Yeah. So the same with love. If you are in love with somebody, you cannot love another person until you fall out of love. I give in the book two examples. One is the opera Carmen. Carmen fall in love with a guy, Don Jose, and then she falls out of love for him, and she can fall in love with somebody else. He doesn't, and he's fighting that because he's still in love with her. A better story I have is from an old movie called Of Human Bondage, 
where this guy falls in love with a woman, she doesn't love him, it's a terrible relationship, but he can never see that. And she keeps breaking up with him, and he meets other people that are much better than her, but he's unable to love them because he's still in love with the old woman. And that will happen to him multiple times. She keeps coming back to his life, causing him a lot of damage, but every time he leaves the woman he's with, because he couldn't love her because he's still in love with the old woman. And only when he falls out of love of the old woman, can he fall in love again with another woman and grow from there into falling out of love from her and then moving to true love. Okay. And so many men, and I think many men listening, potentially have gone through a big breakup in the past or a divorce, and maybe they haven't fully recovered from that and fallen out of love with that woman and then they're struggling for years to date again and and fall in in love again and and so it's it's because they haven't fully recovered from the past experience correct they haven't fallen in completely out of love and what, you have to do that first what advice would you have for someone who's really struggling with that and this was a huge breakthrough for them well it's usually it takes time if the relationship is aborted you can get stuck in that phase let me give you an example. Everybody knows about the movie Titanic. Right. Is the movie Titanic a great love story? I would say no. It's a story of aborted love. She fell in love with this guy, and while she's in that phase with all the moon I mean, and the brain he died. So the love failed to evolve to the further phases. 40, 50 years later, she's still in the same phase of falling in love with this guy. If it was a real person, I can assure you that person never loved another person because they still stuck with that love. It's like a woman who's pregnant with a baby that's four months old and he dies in the uterus and stay in the uterus for 20 years. She will never be able to get pregnant again. So you have to fall in love in order to do that. Sometimes it takes time to be with their partner to reach that phase. Like I believe if the story of the Titanic was real and the guy did not die, but went with her to Boston, give them time, she will eventually discover that he is not the most talented <laughs> painter. He is yeah. not uh, he's, he's the same broke. background as her. He is broke and no she will education. eventually fall out of love from him. All that fun and excitement will eventually go away. But the fact that he died was the fact that made her remember that forever because it's an arrested love story rather than a completed love story. The same with the movie, The English Patient. He fell in love with a woman and was madly in love with her, then she dies. So he continues to be in love with her until he commits suicide. Oh, I haven't seen it. I, I didn't know that. Oh my. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Ruin it. This is a huge, I think this conversation here is huge for a lot of the listeners. And so everyone, you call it fool. Everyone who finds true love will also fall out of love along the way. And I think, uh, and then we, we've discovered here uh, that if there's a breakup or a divorce and you're still in love with that person, and uh, you need to get complete with that break up or divorce before you go on and 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 fall in love again otherwise it'll be a challenge when you're with other women correct and if it doesn't happen naturally you might have to seek some help from professionals yeah the psychologists and other people and that's the field of expertise how to help you to get over that what things you can do to deal with that to eventually fall out of love, have that person totally out of your mind. You don't think about them. You don't obsess about them. You, you start to feel the opposite. They really were bad people, and you, you're glad they're out of your life. <laughs> they're bad people. Yeah, yeah, you start to see reality. Yeah. How, how does understanding the stages of love, how could this possibly prevent lower breakups and divorces? If we if we know this, if we know this, if we know these stages, how can this actually help us? reduce breakups, divorces. Yeah, because when you fall out of love, you have to look at your mate. If you feel I made a pretty good mate, overall my mate is very good. This fun and excitement is gone. You don't send me flowers anymore, but that's not as important. And if you made a good choice, if you feel you are with a good person, just give it time and wait. And with time, true love will come in and everything will change. And that love is true love that will last you for the rest of your life. Not the falling in love, which will last you about two years or maybe three years. 
So let's talk about people who are in relationships for that time period, one to three years, and they keep finding themselves going from one one relationship to the next relationship, and they're all dying in that within that one to three year time frame. What can you conclude with that information? Well, most most of the time is the problem of our beliefs that love should last for a lifetime, that if you fall out of love, then there's something wrong. And it's not true. And if you accept that, then things will be different. Let me give you another example yeah. some people identify with. Yeah. A woman wants to have a baby. It's not an instantaneous thing. She has to go through four phases. First phase, she has to be physiologically mature. A 10-year-old girl has the maternity instinct, but she cannot have a child. She buys a doll. After you are physiologically mature, like when you are selecting a mate, it takes you many years. Children start to dream about when I get married, I'm going to do this or that, I'm going to marry that person, and so on. It takes time. When that phase ends, like in the pregnancy, when she's physiologically mature, the next phase is getting pregnant. It's fun, exciting, especially when they feel the baby is kicking and moving and so on. But it's wrong to believe that this is going to last forever. Every woman knows that's going to last for nine months, and no matter what, it's going to end. If we all believe that falling in love is limited, it's going to end, we sense accept it. A woman, after the end of pregnancy, she has to go a very painful period called labor. She hates it. <laughs> but she knows in advance that if I put up with that, I'll be rewarded by having my baby finally, which I will love and cherish for the rest of my life. So that pain is now tolerable knowing that. We should be able to do the same in love. If I'm with the correct person, if I know that this is just a phase that happened to me, happened to everybody before me, will happen to everybody after me, then you just be patient. Okay, it's going to go away. And gradually, you start to release a different set of chemicals called nonapeptide that will produce all the feelings of true love. And that will last you for a lifetime. Hmm. Wow. So true love can last a lifetime. It does. It can. It Well, it falling in love chemicals are short acting. Uh -huh. They come quickly. They disappear quickly. Yeah. True love chemicals are long acting. They come in slowly and last for a long time. But you can eventually, if you're not with the mate, you can eventually fall out of love. Have you heard women saying, oh, this guy just, his wife died three months ago. I'm not going to date him. I have to give him, quote, time to get over here. Right. They're unconsciously realizing that you have to allow the non apeptide that are in the brain of this person to the old woman to gradually wear out with time and disappear. So later on, two or three years later, I start to add my own non apeptide and have him bond to me. And that's why we discovered by sort of social experimentation that this is useful because it's long acting and lasts for a few years. In reality, when you are with a person, you are making more chemicals every day. So you're continuously replacing what is there and it's long acting. So if you're not with that person for a few months, it doesn't matter. It is still there and it will continue there. Look at the people that are... Uh, have been married for 30 and 40 years. Look how dedicated they are to each other and how that love can last for a long time because they accumulated non apeptides for so many years before that they'd have so much of it to last them for a long time. Yeah. And once someone has reached the, the last stage of true love in their relationship, it, can they fall out of love again? Only if you are, only if some big problem happen okay. or you're away from that person. Okay. Because it's something that you make that wears out. You have to make it again. So if you stop making it again, then eventually it will. Okay. And so you said if away from that person, which leads me to want to ask you, do long distance relationships, can these work? If, if you're away, what does that do to the chemicals with love? Yeah. In my opinion, it doesn't because you lose many of the instincts. Like the smell. Yeah. 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 Like the touch, you know, we know that hugging, kissing, touching actually releases non peptide and cause more bonding and more love. So when you're away from somebody and not doing that, you reduce that. Having sex, people call it making love because actually physically you release chemical that enhance the love. 
So that helps to bond the people together. That's one of the factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so what are the myths of love, like kind of fairy tale fantasies, love as an addiction and, and personality disorders that masquerade as love? Yeah, there's a lot of beliefs that are not based on uh, true science of love, that are just myth. One of them believing the fairy tales in childhood, that they met and they lived happily ever after, that love is just one phase, happened at one time, and that's it. Cinderella went dancing with the prince for a few hours, and that's it. She lived happily for the rest of her life. The same is going to happen to me. I'm going to meet a woman who is beautiful and nice. I'm going to fall in love with her and I'll be happy for the rest of my life. That's not based on reality. That's based on the fantasy of a fiction artist. You know, this is all products of stories imagined by artists. They're not based on science, based on the Im imagination by talented artists. And, and so the movie is really just depicting one stage of love. It's it's not it doesn't show the whole falling out of love and the, and the real the real messy and, and, and the ugly nature of, of the other individual. Just like I think you, you shared a really good example of in Titanic. If they actually did land, she would realize this guy's uneducated. He's broke. He, he's not you know, he's like a thief. Like, you know, he's not up to up to what her standards were. That's correct. That's correct. The problem is all the love novels. All the love movies only cover two phases of love. Yeah. Which Mate selection, meeting yeah. somebody, yeah. and then falling in love, and it ends with that. And it's an incomplete story. But that's what they do. That's what they think people want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And so we can actually get upset when we're not experiencing what we have seen growing up as a child and in our teenage years when we fall we we select a mate we fall in love and then we 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 fall out of love cuz the movies don't show that that's correct and we consider that that the relationship have failed i i had a friend a nurse i worked with who totally believed that if i fall out of love then something wrong i picked up the wrong guy so she marries a guy and divorces him because she fell out of love a few years later, she marries another one. She's madly in love. And two or three years later, she fell out of love. She divorces him again. I talk to her, tell her, well, you are going to fall out of love no matter what you do. This is normal. No, it is not. If I fall in love, it will be for a lifetime. If it's not, then something is wrong. I could have picked up the wrong guy. She have done it like four times. And still, I couldn't convince her that falling out of love is one of the phases of love. Now she decided to wait until she is retired, quote, to devote full-time effort to find the perfect mate. She convinced herself that the problem is the American man. Now she will retire and research in Europe, Afghanistan, whatever it is, where they don't have American man because she believed this is the problem. The real problem is she condition herself, convince herself completely that there's no falling out of love. And if it happens, something is wrong. And I'm not willing to sort of give up that conviction and be realistic. I want to live the fantasy that I fall in love. I have the feeling of falling in love for the rest of my life. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking too, as you were talking of Romeo and Juliet, the story where you know, he's obviously kind of similar to Titanic, like a, a lower class individual, and she's more from the upper class. They fall in love. He kills himself, and then, or she, he puts himself to sleep, and then she kills himself, something like that. And uh, uh, it just shows one stage of love. But who knows if they would have actually, actually been in love in in the long term if they would have been compatible. And also, it shows that love makes you do stupid things where you killed yourself. Correct. William Shakespeare uh, once said that love is mere madness, and there's some truth in that. Hmm. Are there any people? People do strange things when they are in love, and they are unable to see that what they are doing is not realistic. Right. And you cannot convince them otherwise, because the brain perceives it, and whatever the brain perceives is reality. Right. It will continue to be a reality. Yeah. Wow. And is, are there any chemicals related to? that falling in love related to any other drugs that we can compare what's happening to the, to the mind here? Yeah, let me, let me give you another example because uh, many times people that experience true love deny that they ever fell out of love. And there's a reason for that. 
Let me set the stage by giving an experience we discovered from the 60s and 70s. Okay. We discovered a chemical substance called oxytocin, yeah. which induces labor in women. So I have two women. First woman is pregnant with a small size head baby. That baby sailed through the birth canal and in one hour she delivered. A second woman have a large head baby that will get stuck in the birth canal. We have to give them a lot of oxytocin intravenously to stimulate the uterus, make it contract harder, and giving them more and more. And in 20 hours, she finally delivered. You go back three months and ask both of them, what do you think about your labor experience? Common sense and logic will tell you the other one say it was torture 20 hours of that. The other one say, oh, that was nice and easy and so quick. But we discover something very fascinating. The first one will recall the pain as being more severe, lasting longer. The second one that was given oxytocin will feel that, no, it wasn't that bad. The pain wasn't bad. It was very short and quick. So we realize that oxytocin alters our perception of pain and suffering. The pain wasn't as bad. The misery wasn't as bad. When you fall in love and true love, use the same chemicals, one or two. One of them is oxytocin. And it does the same effect for us. We start to feel there's very little suffering from the other person. Whatever they did, that was really nothing minor. It really didn't bother me. And they forget it. Yeah. You almost forget that they fell out of love. Because once you have the oxytocin, you become like the woman who is given a lot of oxytocin to deliver a baby. Yeah. You forget it. It doesn't seem as severe or as bad or poor. It didn't even exist at all. Yeah. So the chemicals altered our perception and it is for our benefit. To help us get through the falling out of love period, that stage. And to make true love last forever. Yeah. Because when you don't feel the pain and suffering from another person, you're more forgiving, more tolerant. Yeah. The chemical causes the altered perception of your partner where you become again the most attractive and most sexy one around and everybody else is a downgrade. <laughs> As a result, you, you have monogamy. Yeah. Who wants to downgrade? Nobody. No one. Yeah. Okay, wow. The, you know what's interesting question just came up here. What happens to a man's mind when he is watching porn? Can he fall in love with porn? The answer is absolutely not. Sex and love are two separate things. There's some overlap between them, but they're not one and the same. Some people who claim to be a neuroscientist claim that love starts by lust, romance, and then attachment. But lust have nothing to do with love. Lust and love are two separate things, but have a relationship. Like a doctor and his nurse. The doctor has an influence on the nurse. The nurse has an influence on the doctor. But at the end of the day, the doctor is not the nurse. The nurse is not the doctor. They're two separate things. I understand. And so Sex, it's, a, it's a separate but, addiction then. It's a the separate point. thing. It's, it's right. a separate thing here. It's not yeah, it's a, a love separate. thing here. No, it is not. It is a sex drive. Sex drive is different from love. Sex drive is towards a range of individuals. Love is toward one single individual. Sex have a satiety center, meaning satisfied. I had enough, I cannot do any more. We don't have a satiety center for love. We always want more from birth to death. We never feel, oh, that's enough love for today, honey, tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> never happens. <laughs> We, we give people sex hormone to stimulate the sex drive. Does it make them feel they love their partner more? It doesn't because it's a different system. Mm. How can... Uh, continue. Or did you have more to say there? So you know, love is not sex and sex is not love. But love makes sex feel good or better. Yeah. And sex helps with this chemical that bind the love. Mm. But just like the relationship between the doctor and the nurse. Okay. They affect each other, but they're still at the end to separate systems. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. And how can a man's addiction to porn affect him while in love? If he is in, in true fears of true love, his perception of his partner will change with the other people in porn seems ugly and not attractive at all. And in a sense, turn him off. If you still turn on by porn, then you have not reached true love phase. And another point, Andrew, to remember is that not everybody have the same ability to love. 
Each person have a different ability to love, and there are some people that have no ability to love at all, based on the genes, based on the structure of the brain. Let me give you an example, an experiment. You know the the field mice. Yeah. It's called volumetrically. Okay. We have a field mice in the prairies, and we have field mice in the mountainous west, in the Rocky Mountains. The ones in the prairie are monogamous. They pick up a spouse and stay with him for life. And if the spouse dies, they never take another one. The one in the mountain and in the Rocky Mountains, they are promiscuous. They never bond to anybody. They never select one person more than another one in subsequent mating. They just want sex and done. Thank you. Goodbye. They went and examined them and find both of them release one of the chemicals for true love, oxytocin, as the other one. The two exactly do the same thing. But they found the receptor, the part that receives it in the brain, in the prairie, monogamous ones, is there. And the mountain ones, they genetically have a defective gene, so the receptor is not developed. So there is a chemical, release it, but it cannot work because there's nothing to receive it. Like you have a key, but you have no keyhole. You cannot use it. They went even further and took the gene from the monogamous prairie voles and implanted it in the promiscuous mountainous or mountain voles. And what happened? This wall became monogamous. So the monogamy was based on set of genes. The promiscuous one lacked these genes. And we have found that also in humans. So how much you love someone really does not depend on that person. It depends on you and your own genes. You can have a lot of genes for loving and you love intensely anybody no matter what or the other way around. And how much a woman loves you doesn't depend on you what you did for her. It depends on her and her own genes. If she has a lot of genes for bonding with a person and having love, she will do that. If she doesn't, she will not. So... Can someone like that who doesn't have those genes, can they find and, and have true love? In all honestly, no, you cannot. If you don't have the genes for that, you cannot. And some people spend a lifetime not able to find someone to love because they just don't have the genes for that. Sometimes also the relative quantities, and we have evidence for that. Another chemical called vasopressin, which is like the oxytocin, they're like a twin brother, and a gene that gets you to make it. And they looked at the gene repeat. It's like an assembly line telling people, build one layer of bricks. They build one. If you say, build, build, they put two layers. Build, 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 it will be three, three layers. So the more you repeat, the higher the wall. We have that for the vasopressin receptors. If you have two repeats, you have twice as many. If you have five repeats, you have five as many. So some people have a lot of repeats and as a result have a lot of receptor to receive it and they're proven to have more bonding ability, more appreciation of the love and the relationship than those that have lower repeats because they have less quantity and a lot of people in between. Is any of this created, is it just genes or is any of this also a part of how that person was raised and the environment they grew up in as a child? Environment has an effect, but it's predominantly genes. It's predominantly genes. And people don't realize that. We didn't realize that until, you know, recently, in the last 10 years, we started to be able to read the genetic code. We start to be able to study the genetic code. And we keep finding out that a lot of things we do are based on our genes. So what I'm, what I'm getting here is that there are some people out there who will not find true love. There's some people that are not able to, to grow into true love, or some people have it weak. So the true love is not as, it, as intense as other people. So will, will they be constant people who find mate, fall in love, and then fall out of love, and then repeat that cycle? Because they cannot move to the next phase of true love. Some people can do that. But they may still stay together because of the society that we live in where financial and, and, and socially, you know, they might still stay together, but they might not reach the pinnacle of true love. That's possible. And there's quite a bit of that. 
would the other partner so do both people have to reach true love or can one reach true love and the other is unable to it depends on each one's genes and that's the challenge when you meet someone it's very difficult to tell about their genes you might be able to look at the past that can help you to tell the present and the future but people don't always tell you about their past yeah okay okay i for time's sake I, I, let's dive into the knowledge round i'm just going to ask you a few more rapid fire questions sure and then we'll go from there Have you ever felt like you weren't the strong, grounded man that you know you're capable of becoming? Like there's something more inside of you, but you don't know how to get it out. Me too. Years ago, I was broke, sleeping on my brother's couch, and just got out of a serious breakup that left me on the floor for months. Now, I have a multiple six-figure business. I'm in the best shape of my life, have an abundant dating life, and live on the beach here in San Diego. I want you to break through too and create the life that you want. And because people kept asking me so many questions... I've created this free video training series on becoming a strong, grounded man so that you can have more freedom, love, and connection in your life. I'll also teach you how to build real backbone to boost your masculinity as a man so that you can have more respect, power, and confidence personally and professionally. Simply go to kfmconfidence.com to get this training. Again, that's kfmconfidence.com. Also, I share the number one conversation that your father never had with you about women. That will be a major wake-up call for 90% of you and will improve the quality of your relationships forever. Go to kfmconfidence.com to get this free training today. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives, starting in three, two, one, showtime. So the first question I have for you, more on the topic of life advice, and so the first question is, what advice would you give to someone who's feeling lost and unsure of their purpose? First, you mean a purpose finding a mate or purpose in life? Purpose in life. Yeah, you have to first thing is to look into yourself and see what you really enjoy doing. It doesn't matter what it is. If you enjoy doing something, you will always succeed in it. So don't do a job for the sake of doing a job. Do a job that you enjoy, even if you get paid less, even if you get less benefits. Eventually, you'll be happier. Eventually, you'll succeed more. Okay. And what do you think is holding most men back from becoming stronger grounded men today? Many times it's fear. The fear of failure is a paralyzing force. I saw recently a movie about a woman, I can't remember the name of the movie, that invented some cleaning uh, things. I think it was like a broom and was supposed to stand on TV to market it. She felt scared. She couldn't talk. She couldn't move. She couldn't hear what they were telling her. She couldn't do anything because fear is paralyzing. Fear can paralyze all your sensation, can paralyze everything you can do. You have to beat fear. Fear comes from the automatic part of the brain and it uses less energy. Courage is from the conscious brain. It takes more energy, more effort. But you have to actively beat fear by courage. You have to take risks. And unless you take risk, you cannot succeed. Mm. That's interesting. That fear is, it takes less energy to fall into fear. It takes more energy to fall into courage. And, and, and that's why we often will fall into the fear. It's, it's easier. Yes, I remember distinctly, I had a patient once and asked him, what you do? I said, I have uh, seven companies. So I asked what seven companies you have? And he told me, seven companies, totally different fields. So my next question, how did you end up having seven companies? You know what was the answer? Because I started 100 companies, 93 of them failed, and seven succeeded. So I ended up with seven companies. <laughs> and I admire that. Yes, you failed, so no big deal. I'll try again. I fail again. I'll try again. <laughs> and one day I'm going to succeed. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah. Not just once, but he succeeded seven times and failed 93 times. It didn't bother him. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Now, what? so, so your book here, I want to give credit to you, is True Love. How do you science to understand love? Go to Amazon, guys, pick it out. But Dr. Fred Nor, what has been three 
of your most influential books that have helped you in your journey and why? In my journey in life? Yes. In general. Just yes. in general, yeah. I like I like the book Poor Man, Rich Man, or Poor Dad, Rich Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yes, it's uh, a great book. Rob, Robert to, Kiyosaki, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a great book I liked. And I like some old philosophy books by Aristotle. Uh-huh. I like the logic analyzing things. Yeah. And then, of course, the Grey's Anatomy helped me to see the reality of the human being, its asset and its liability. Grey's Anatomy. Is that, that's not, you're not talking about the TV show, are you? No, no, no. The so, textbook, the textbook that I used. Okay. It's a great book. Yeah. I, I was thrown the, off. I was like, the TV show I, had nothing to do I, with that's, just where, that's where you learned. Uh, I learned so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard in episode two. <laughs> okay, great, great. Now, this one is a, I'm really excited to ask you this question here. So imagine you had 60 seconds with your 25 year old self, Fred, if you can envision where he's at personally, professionally, in his relationships, knowing what you now know today. What would you tell him to do and what would you tell him not to do? I'll tell him to be realistic. I remember when I was 25, I wanted to marry a woman who was as beautiful as Linda Carter and as smart as a philosopher called Simone Beauvoir. I never wondered if such a person could ever exist in real life. And if that extremely rare person exists, why on earth would they marry a medical student in Egypt? I was unrealistic in my image of the perfect mate. What I would do now is try to bring expectation to reality. What is reasonable for me and what is sort of fair. A relationship has to be an equal fit. Everybody has to have the same abilities. Anything else? Persevere in life. You can always succeed and never give up and uh, never accept second place. Always shoot for the first place and keep improving, improving until you get there. Is that your philosophy on life and success right there? Yes, nobody is better than you. They might be harder working than you. If you put the time and the effort, you will achieve it. No matter what it is, you can achieve it. Yeah, great. All right, this has been very powerful. I'm glad that we had this here. And for all the listeners, again, here, the author of True Love, How to Use Science to Understand Love, Dr. Fred Noor, it's N-O-U-R, and... What what's exciting you today? What's getting you out of bed in the morning today these days? Uh, actually, uh, working on the book, working on producing the book, finishing the book, uh, getting it out there as best as it could be. I want a book that reflect me. Reflect. When will it be live? It will be a release on Valentine's Day. <laughs> All right, what a great book uh, for Valentine's Day. And it was be- it was born on Valentine's Day. I gave my first lecture on Valentine's yeah. Day. Yeah. So I felt that would be appropriate. Uh, I got to tell you that you shared some very powerful lessons here. And I mean, I interview a lot of people and and the lessons you've shared here on love, I think is very impactful. I think my audience is very excited to get your book when it comes out on Valentine's Day. We'll be searching on Amazon for it. And I I mean, I got to tell you these four stages of love and understanding that we fall out of love and and understanding that it's a, it's a part of the process. And, and, And there's just so much that we've learned here today. I'm really excited to go through this again and summarize all this for my audience in a, in a, in a blog post. But, uh, Dr. Fred Nort, I got. I, thank you so much for your time. I, you're, you know, it's in your bio. One of the one of the top rated physicians here in in the United States. And I just, you know, thank you for your time and and here with my community. I really thank you. It is absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast. Hundreds of interviews and millions of downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement and we're just getting started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes because it really helps the podcast grow so we can impact even more men in the world who need this. Guys, this is all about living with purpose, where every day you only do things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. And always remember, love the life you have while creating the life of your dreams. Go to kfmfree.com to get a surprise bonus I've made for my listeners. Again, that's kfmfree.com for something that's changed my life and I'm offering it to you for free. Also, check out my Amazon best-selling books that I've written for you to help you crush life at kfmfree.com. 
kfmauthor.com. Again, that's kfmauthor.com to see all the books I've created to help you break through in life. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, founder of knowledgeformen.com, and I'll see you in the next episode.